If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1 to 6. Jeremiah 18, 1 to 6. Here we read, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my word. So all of a sudden, God speaks to Jeremiah to rise up, go to the potter's house, and at the potter's house, you will hear the word of the Lord. And I think sometimes, you know, we, you know, uh, sit back and say, God, speak to me, and, and God's speaking, and we're just not obedient. And for Jeremiah to hear the word of the Lord, he had to get up, go to the potter's house, and at the potter's house, God spoke to him a word for the nation of Israel. And this is what he saw at the potter's house. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, here the word of the Lord. O oh, house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Thus saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hands, O oh, house of Israel. Father, I pray as the word goes forth, it would spark something in our spirit. Lord, as I've said earlier, Lord, there may be things in our life that we struggle with, but I believe when we're in the hands of the potter, that you're molding us, you're fashioning us, Father, into something beautiful. And Lord, let us not look at what we are today, but Lord, I believe that you're creating vessels of honor for your glory. And so, Lord, I ask you to continue the work in each one of our hearts and lives in Jesus' name. In verse 6, it says, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter saith the Lord? Behold, as clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hands, O house of Israel. Again, God takes Jeremiah down to the potter's house. Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I'll cause thee to hear my words. We need to hear the word of the Lord. We don't need to hear another sermon. We need to hear the word of the Lord. And I believe that when he speaks, lives are transformed by the power of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Jesus. I like what God does here. He uses a simple illustration to reveal a biblical truth here. He reveals his heart. He reveals his hand here to Jeremiah by going down to the potter's house. Let me regress just a little bit. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we read this. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And verse 27 goes on to says this, And so God created man in his image, in his own image. And in the image of God created he them, male and female, Created he them. I want you to think about this for just a moment. I want you to get a revelation that when God created Adam and Eve, he created it, them in his image. He molded them in his likeness. You see, some of the earliest images I have of God is a potter with muddy hands creating human beings. And I think, and this is my revelation, 
I think one of the reasons that God takes Jeremiah down to the potter's house is to remind Israel of their roots, where they came from. And then he says to them, as clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hands. This is the image that God spoke to me this morning. I was just milking my, my cows one morning and kind of arguing with God about preaching on Jeremiah 18, saying, God, everybody knows this story. And God just really speaks to my heart. This, and he says, I want you to leave everyone there on Sunday morning with the image of me having big hands. God, God's, I want you to leave everyone here this morning with the image that my God, your God has big hands. So I'm going to share some scriptures this morning about God having big hands. In, in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 11 and 12, we read this. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers his lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. And then verse 12 goes on to say this. He measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. How big is that, folks? I mean, I've been to the Pacific Ocean, and I've been to the Atlantic Ocean. I stood there and see the waves come in and in and in. There's a lot of water. But my God measured all of that water in the palm of his hands. I'm going to tell you, folks, my God has a big hand. My God has a big hand. And then that verse goes on. It just brings chills to my very core of my being. It says, and with the breadth of his hand, he has marked out the heavens. With a breath outstretched our hand, he measured the heavens. I preached a sermon years ago about how big the heavens are. They say the nearest star is 44,000 light years away. And I asked my sister, which is a doctor, said, how, how fast is lightning? Travel or uh, light travel is just fast, <laughs> you know. But every second light travels, and and yet the nearest star is four thousand light years away. And I say, you know, four thousand years probably Abraham and Sarah were thinking about having Isaac, and that's how long it took for that light to travel from that nearest star to Earth. And here in the scripture says, with his outstretched hand, he measured. The heavens, my God has a big hand. I want you to get that image. And then it goes on and says, and who held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountain on his scales and the hills in the balance. Oh, we serve a big God. Isaiah 45 verse 12 says, his hand spread out the heavens. And then my favorite comes from Isaiah 49 verses 15 and 16. But Zion said, again, his people being a little bit rebellious, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. And then God says, can a woman forget the baby of her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. But listen to this. See I have engraved you on the palm of my hand. Your walls will never be before me. Now, I had a little bit of fun in the earlier service. You all right if I have a little bit of fun? You know, and, and, and this is no slight on anybody that has a tattoo. But tattoos, you know, are not my fave. I had a chemistry teacher in grade 12. He was in World War II, and by the time I'd seen him, he was old, and he had a wrinkled-up tattoo that looked horrible on him, you know, and, and, I, and I've never been a tattoo, and if you got a tattoo and there's some beautiful, my daughter has tattoos. I'm just not a tattoo, and I, you know, I, I struggle with it a little bit, but, but you know what? I, I'm reading the scripture, folks, and God has a tattoo because <laughs> my name is engraved on his hand. Well, how else would it be engraved on his hand if God didn't have something tattooed on his hand? That big, massive hand has my name, your name, tattooed to it. Woo! Ah, still don't like tattoos. 
Sorry. <laughs> now, you know, inevitably, someone will show me. See, isn't this what Teresa's going to say? See, look at this. <laughs> Here, 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 here's why I say this. These poetic images are huge to me. It is a powerful, permanent reminder to me that he's got my little problem. If you can see God with a big hand, there's not a problem in your life that he cannot handle. Do you believe that? There's nothing that we can go through. How many people know that cancer is not bigger than my God's hand? There's no disease, there's no sickness, there's no mountain that is bigger than my God's hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's got it, folks. That's the image that he asked me to relate to you. Our God's got every single problem that may arise in any situation at any time. Pastor Boyd doesn't believe me. So I'm going to take you to a couple more scriptures. Exodus chapter 7 verse 5 says this, and the, and the Egyptians will know that I am God when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring them, the Israelites, out of it. It says, your enemy will know my hand when I bring you out of captivity. Hallelujah. You know, and I think at the end of the day, they knew how big God's hand because they all died in that Red Sea. But Moses says this in Exodus 13, verse 3. And Moses said to the people, commemorate this day, the day that you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with his mighty hand. Hallelujah. The arm of flesh may disappoint you. You may share your woes to people, and they may disappoint you. But I'm telling you, if you're willing to put your hands in the hands of Almighty God, He will never disappoint you. Hallelujah! Glory to God. Hallelujah. His hand is not so short that He can't reach out to anyone and every need here this morning. Isaiah 59 says so. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened. That it cannot save. God's hand is not a short hand. Neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. Ezra 7 verse 28. New scripture for me. Probably read it a hundred times. And I just a farmer remember. Um, but this is good. This is good. And I was strengthened. As the hand of the Lord my God was upon. Do you ever just sit there in your easy chair and say, Lord, place your hand? And it says, and as he placed my hand upon me, I was strengthened. I, I believe he's anointed. You know, I, I believe that, you know, I, I, you know I, I, I hate to say it because it looks like, but, but I, I believe that, you know, I, if you look at me, I'm a dairy farmer, and half the time my hands are, but, you know, God said to me years ago, when I put my hands in his hands, they would be his hands that stretch. And I, I believe that there's a mantle upon my life that, that when I pray for people, it's God's hand. There's something about laying on of hands, folks. Can I give one more scripture, Sue? Okay, Sue, one more regarding the hand of God. This one's good. Psalm 37, verse 23. She tells me never to tease her. I know it doesn't. Psalm 37, verse 23 and 24 says this. The steps of a good man are ordered by who? The Lord. And he delights in his path. But 24 says, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. Why? For the Lord upholds him with his hand. We may stumble, but the hand of God will cause us not to fall to a place that we can't rise up and move forward in the power of God. There's something about his hands, folks. There's something about coming under the shadow of his wing of protection. There's safety. 
there's security in that. So if you get nothing of anything that I say this morning, I want you to know that God's got a great hand in your need. The second thing I believe that was laid on my heart this week, you probably all know, but this is good. The second thing I see these of importance is that God is not looking for a new lump of clay. And, and you all should shout, hallelujah. How many people have messed up, you know, thought you were marred up in the eyes of God? And, and this, is, this is an encouraging scripture because God's not looking for a new lump of clay. I'm telling you, our God recycles and reuses, and that's good news. My God recycles and reuses, because in this scripture, it says that even though the first lump was marred, there was problems with the first lump. God was not giving up on the Israelites. God didn't say, you've gone too far. God was not giving up. God's heart is never to give up on Anyone, no one, God's heart is to take our lump of clay, collect all of our brokenness, all of our impurities, all of our weaknesses, and remold us into vessels of honor for his glory. You got any impurities in your life? God wants to take his hand and work them out, work them out to create something beautiful. You know, I had to learn the hard way. My wife's here for the service, so I have to be very careful. <laughs> but this is a true story. Now, this is, this is not half a truth where I like to, you know, this is, this is unfortunately a really truth. So my dad had died, and it was early, uh, early 2000, and, and, and I was farming full-time and pastoring full-time, and, and I was coming in from the barn, and I was saying to my wife, I'm too tired. I can't do this anymore, you know, and it wasn't a bad statement, but I, she'd heard it probably a hundred times, and so we were in the kitchen. She had a pile of plates. You know what she did? She dropped them on the floor, and they shattered into thousands of pieces, and she says, Jim, you're broken. You know the only one that could fix me? Creator. You know, and that was a prophetic gesture in my life, and, and I realized that things had to change. You know, I, at one time I started, and, and I was having a guest pastor once a week, or once a month, and all of a sudden I realized there was no guest pastor. I was preaching all the time, and, and I was just wearing myself down. You remember Moses? He wanted to commit suicide because he, he was so burdened by his people. And his father-in-law said, you know, you got to sit back and let other people take some of the workload. Yeah. You know, sometimes we just need a prophetic gesture to realize that, you know, you know, you're just not doing what God has called you to do. You know, sit back and allow me to do it. I, I believe that was for somebody. God's heart is to take our lump of clay. Even if your heart is shattered into a million pieces, God can take our pain, he can take our fear, he can take our guilt, he can take our grief, and he can transform those broken pieces into something beautiful. I mean, folks, you think Christians don't go through it, and I'm going to tell you, even the last few weeks I've been talking to Christians that have come to me and said, Jim, I'm broken. The enemy started whispering a lie, and they began to believe the lie of their past. And they needed God to come and intervene in their behalf and not see what they see, but see what God sees in their life. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah again and said this, The first piece crumbled in the hands of the potter, but he made it into another peace that blessed him more. God can transform us, folks, into something better. With God, our scars, our imperfection, our brokenness 
put into his hands become stories of triumph and grace. They become stories of God's ability and not our ability. He's able to turn lead into gold. He's able to do what we cannot do. His ability is far beyond. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so are his ways higher and his thoughts higher than ours. I told the story this, uh, this morning, and it's a real, tr again, another true story. Not that I don't tell true stories, but this is pretty cool. <laughs> that, that didn't come out well. <laughs> but, you know, we, we had it rough when I, you know, like now that I'm 67, I realized, man, you have a garbage truck come right in front of your door and pick up your garbage. Well, back then, when I was a kid, we had to go to the dump. And I always liked going to the dump because sometimes you got treasures in the dump. And uh, so dad was there unloading our garbage and there was a tricycle, you know, and that tricycle was someone else's junk. Maybe it was yours, Brad, I don't know. <laughs> but we took it home, dad fixed it up and, and I played with that tricycle for years and years and years. And then I outgrew grew that tricycle and, and, and I, I think we took it across the road in the bush and just discarded it with a bunch of other medical metal. And my cousin comes along and sees that tricycle and says, that's an old-fashioned tricycle. She brings it home, paints it up, and is on her veranda today, sitting there as an antique. You know, and years ago, some probably 55 years ago, someone threw it out and said it was a bunch of junk. It matters whose hands you're in. I added a couple of scriptures this morning. Uh, Romans uh, 9, 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay? He's gone. This blob of clay, you may say, is worthless. But after being in his hands, we're not. Um, I wish I came up. I, I wish I was, you know, like... Anyway, someone come up with this, not me. A basketball may only cost $34, but in the hands of Steve Curry, it's worth $34 million. A, Bosco, uh, a baseball only costs $22, but in the hands, I, I say Tony Fernandez, because I know him, it's worth $36 million. A tennis ball may cost $3, but in the hands of Ro Roger Federer, it's worth $77 million. A golf ball may cost $2, but in the hands of Tiger Wood, it's worth $40 three million dollars my point is this it matters whose hands you're in when you're in the hands of God you're priceless and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter so he made it again, another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make. God's not finished with any one of us, folks. God's still working on us, shaping us into something wonderful. God's working on us, shaping us all towards wholeness. God does not give up on any of us. Yes. Our lives can become messy. At times, we can even feel like a warped piece of pottery instead of a perfect piece of art. But I want you to remember that God's not finished with us. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God has prepared for us in advance. Oh, wait, one more? Script? Okay. I got time. Second Timothy 2.20 says this, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some of honor and some of dishonor. And you say, wow, but 21, what's, what's the difference between a vessel of honor and dishonor? Verse 21 says this, if a man therefore purge himself from these things, 
he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Bill's sitting there. What do you mean by that, Jeff? I'm going to tell you what I mean. We have a tendency when things get tough to get off the potter's wheel. You know, because what, what's happening when the clay's on the, he's pushing out every impurity that we have. And, you know, when, when things get rough, we say, that hurts, and we jump off. I, I'm going to tell you what happens. Do you want to know what happens to a, a vessel that gets off too soon? You end up with a crack. Or we become crackpots. <laughs> Seriously. We become crackpots. <laughs> So if you want to be a vessel that God, you know, stay on the wheel. Don't become a, a secondary vessel. Allow him to purge you. Allow him to take your hands and, and work out those areas in your life that need to be worked out, that you become a work of art for his honor and for his glory. I believe God's got a shelf, you know, and that shelf is shining with vessels that have purified themselves. And I want to be part of that shelf. I think. Mean, I just thought it came to me years ago. I preached a sermon, and I brought an old, you know, the old-fashioned, boy, my age. Anyway, my, you ever been to the hospital, and they have that, uh, you know, where they pee or poo in the pan? I says, you could be one of those obstacles in the kingdom of God, or, or you can be, you know, a, a master work of art. You choose. And, the, and how you choose is staying on the potter's wheel to work out our imperfections. For his glory and for his kingdom. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. We do not want to be a church full of crackpots. We don't. We want to be vessels of honor. As we sung this morning, we want to be a light in the world around us. That the world would be so attractive that, Lord, instead of having 150 people here on a Sunday morning, we will have more than 300. We'll be so full that they'll be lined up the door waiting to hear and receive your hand, your touch. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.